Good morning, everybody. It's it's time for the second day. Hope you had a pleasant night at the castle, and you came home safely with your hands on the cover. <laughs> yes. I hope you all had a good breakfast and have taken this first important coffee. Takes a while before the next one will come. Yeah, the program says summary of yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> we can see uh, a field. We can see a lot of interest in intre interesting discussion following the presentations yesterday, and uh, we perceive a field with long-standing tradition, uh, but that still continues with basic research, field works, inventories, but also advances with uh, what we perceive more tran transdisciplinary research and approaches uh, through case studies, uh, transnational overviews, and multiplicitary <laughs> multiple methods and big data. Uh, not uh, all research and efforts are accessible and we can see that results are partly captured in or <laughs> encapsulated in, uh, in through language barriers but we see also examples where this previously grey literature is being produced and published in, in books like not least your publications, uh, Robin, uh, and accessible open access, uh, which make it easier to collaborate. Uh, a critical remark could be that we see a kind of still a hegemony of this cross-section drawing. Uh, it would be possible we have a challenge here still to take this kind of analytical leap from observation of form to the qualities behind and the, uh, the societal context uh, of construction. Uh, but we have tried to infiltrate also you here. Yeah, oh, you too. Yeah. <laughs> we have been trying a little bit to listen on your conversa conversations during the coffee breaks, the dinner yesterday and little bit about the questions and so on and uh, we have we are very happy we perceive that th uh, this conference is very well needed and that many of you are interested in some kind of a continuation if possible the question is how can this this continue in a viable way for everybody should it be a conference like this that it's more or less international um, should workshops be organized, maybe with uh, student students incorporated or with thir uh, certain teams, the carpenters team or going down to the more the church room and connect it with the attics and so on? Should we look on a broader context geographically when we work together? Or there is so many issues to bring up and uh, I'm going to get uh, give you a little bit of a task now this morning here until the late uh, the latest uh, point on our program that is the discussion and the summary um, talk to your mates when we have coffee and breaks uh, come together and and ask each other what is possible can we do this is it possible to do this when should we do it and so on and please come up with some uh, points afterwards when we discuss this, what is possible. So we get a little bit of a hint. Uh, how is the interest? Is it possible to move on? Or should we do it another way? Should it be publication way or physical way? It would be very useful, I think, for everybody to try to concretize <coughs> the future of moving on here, already now, when we are together. Could we take a uh, next step together, or mm -hmm. shall we go home to our sh chambers and... <laughs> and attics. Yeah, <laughs> and attics. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a good question. <laughs> so please think about that and, and talk to each other in small groups or in bigger groups. Uh, let's start the program here. We are now moving on to uh, um, a lecture from abroad. Uh, we are now moving down to France and uh, the roof structures in the northern France mainly and the transition between the very interesting moment between the Romanesque and the Gothic. And I'm very happy to say welcome to uh, Frédéric Pau. Frédéric Pau is, um, you're a carpenter, he's an archaeologist, he's involved with many different objects uh, in France. He is a research fellow at Laboratoire Archaeologie et Territoire and also connected to Centre National de Recherche Scientifique. And we are all looking forward to, to hear you talk today. Um, we had one big hero here yesterday, Kalle, <laughs> and today we will have another one, and that is Robin. <laughs> <laughs> you are so good. <laughs> uh, we have a solution here that Frédéric will talk French, which is much nat natural for him. And Robin, who is a polyglot, will <laughs> translate pieces of it uh, uh, along the side. And we have dedicated a little bit longer time for this uh, presentation. So we all take it calm and easy and enjoy it very good. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci well, beaucoup. Bienvenue. Puis merci aussi à Robin pour euh, pouvoir me traduire parce que my English is so bad. <laughs> euh, merci de m'avoir invité euh, en tant que Français pour vous parler des charpentes françaises. Euh, même si la France est quand même très loin euh, de la Scandinavie et de ce que l'on a vu jusqu'à présent. Thank you very much for having invited me to talk about French. Uh, roof structures, uh, even if France may seem very far from Scandinavia. Uh, mais uh, l'histoire que je vais vous raconter maintenant est quasiment la même que celle que nous avons vue jusqu'à présent uh, en Scandinavie, en Norvège, en Suède, en Lettonie, en, en Germanie, enfin en Allemagne. Uh, C'est les mêmes charpentes que vous allez voir tout de suite. Oui, nous avons la même development and uh, kinds of uh, carpentry in, uh, well, in France, as we have seen yesterday in several other countries. So we can see there are large similarities. Donc ce sont les mêmes charpentes et la même histoire. Mais en France, euh, cette histoire est euh, plus rapide que ce que l'on voit en Scandinavie. So it's the same history, but you see, it goes a bit faster in France. It always goes a bit faster in France. <laughs> Donc, je vais euh, évoquer les plus anciennes charpentes connues en France et aboutir euh, aux grandes charpentes des cathédrales gothiques, comme celle ici de la cathédrale de Bourges, pour expliquer l'évolution mécanique euh, des, des structures. Uh, we will go from the oldest preserved uh, roof structures and remains uh, and continue on to go up in the real big cathedral projects where there are new mechanical challenges. Uh, la plus ancienne charpente connue en France est celle de Rochecorbon, uh, qui a été découverte il y a quelques années, uh, où nous avons une charpente assez typique, um, comme uh, on l'a vu. Uh, dans les communications précédentes. Uh, this is the oldest yet known and dated structure in this part of France, Roche-Corbon. Roche uh, it was quite newly discovered, uh, so still much things to discover. And, uh, well, we can recognize many important traits from other structures we have seen. Bon, la charpente a été remaniée au 19e siècle, mais on a encore beaucoup de réemploi. It was rebuilt in the eight, uh, 19th century, but uh, with many reused parts of the original structure. Et uh, l'église se présente telle qu'elle pouvait être au 11e siècle avec encore sous plafond. And even the, the ceiling could be original or at least it was such one. Avec des fermes qui, sont, qui étaient à l'origine distantes de 1 mètre. We have a spacing of the trusses of 1 meter. Des entrées convexes. And the, the same 
convex uh, tie beams as Kalle showed us yesterday qui sont liés euh, à la croissance euh, des arbres euh, qui, sont, euh, qui sont faites euh, dans, des, dans des futaies assez basses. Uh, it has a connection to uh, actually the, the size and shape of the trees and uh, uh, they were taken in the very low section of woods, uh, timbers in a wood of, well, different ages. Mm. Et ce sont des fûts qui sont pyramidaux. Oui, oui. The, the, the trees that are a bit pyramidical in the growth. Mm. Et euh, le, donc ce sont des arbres qui sont très épais et le reste ce sont des, des, des bois qui sont extrêmement fins et ce sont des chevrons qui sont du châtaignier, exceptionnellement, c'est exceptionnel. Oui, uh, well, uh, you have very straight proportions, uh, straight lines and very delicate uh, rafters. Autre charpente euh, qui a été trouvé il y a un an, c'est la charpente du milieu du XIe siècle de l'église de l'Écôde, où on retrouve le même principe de, de charpente avec une, une, une descente des charges directement sur les entrées. Ce roof a été découvert très récemment dans l'Écôde, aussi a été réutilisé dans beaucoup de parties de roof roof XIe siècle. Very typically, the, the loads from the rafters is transferred down to the, the tie beam. Avec, euh, comme on le voit pour toutes les charpentes du XIe siècle en France, des assemblages à mi-bois qui sont très simples. And uh, you see the same joinery as in most uh, uh, roof structures of uh, this century in France. Uh, you have this uh, uh, <coughs> straight lap joints. Uh, in the half the thickness of the, the timber, the adjoining timber. Et ici, avec une croisée des charpes, qui est l'une des, des premières euh, recensées. Uh, it's one, I think it's the first uh, example of this kind of uh, crossing struts <coughs> in the French material. <coughs> On a pu retrouver euh, dans euh, les maçonneries une planche qui appartenait au plafond du XIe siècle. And in the masonry, we could find uh, one of the, the ceiling uh, beam, the ceiling boards that were inserted in this, uh, this uh, tracing on the bottom part of the tie beams. Et euh, les chevrons qui appartenaient à cette charpente, qui était en réemploi, euh, montraient des traces de chevilles tous les euh, tous les 30 cm à 40 cm. Oui. Euh we have uh, traces for the oh uh, which called the the the, cav, the small timbers for carrying uh, the coverage of the roof et on, the, on the rafters. Et qui était destiné à fixer les voliges comme on le voit euh, en Suède un peu partout euh, aussi en Norvège aussi. Oui. So uh, many examples from other countries Sweden and Norway as well. Mais en France, c'est la première fois qu'on voit ça, parce que d'habitude, ce sont des latis avec des clous. Uh, it's the first example in, in France of this, but otherwise, uh, c'est le, it's the lattice pour le, le toit de tuile. Mm. Well, otherwise, it's normally the covering with the tiles. Donc des exemples avec des croisées des charpes, on en a d'autres, euh, beaucoup qui vont apparaître au XIIe siècle, comme ici. Encore à l'église de Rochecorbon. And we have the same examples of these uh, crossing struts uh, coming later in the 12th century as well. Et ce que l'on voit apparaître au début du 12e siècle, c'est l'ergot, ce petit, ce petit yeah. trait ici, qui, que l'on n'avait pas avant euh, au 11e siècle. Yeah. And uh, what's new in the 12th century is we have this this uh, lap joints with a notch, uh, which is something quite new then. Et à partir du, des premières décennies du XIIe siècle, les assemblages sur l'entrée vont être remplacés par des tenons mortaises. Uh, and uh, also already in the 12th century, you also get tenon mortis joinery. Uh, but actually uh, replace the old lap joint. Um, donc ici au 12e siècle, au début du 12e siècle, donc on, on retrouve 
euh, exactement le même type de charpente romane, avec ici une croupe qui est faite avec des demi-fermes. Et euh, ce que l'on voit aussi sur beaucoup de charpentes romanes en France, c'est les entrées qui débordent à l'extérieur des murs et qui sont parfois sculptées, comme on le voit ici. Mm -hmm. And you uh, also find uh, these tie beams that are going outside of the masonry and sometimes also with a sculpted end. And you have these kind of uh, obsidial uh, half frames for the round abscess that uh, appears. Et euh, ici, c'est une église qui possède une voûte maçonnée. Et pour pouvoir construire la charpente, ils ont rehaussé les maçonneries pour poser la charpente au-dessus de la voûte. And uh, this is one of the early vaulted stone vault, and uh, to be able to have the, the roof structure, uh, they raised the masonry um, that it got higher. Et ça évoque euh, toutes les difficultés que les architectes vont vont rencontrer au XIIe siècle avec les voûtes maçonnées qui vont se développer. And this is an early example of how I tried to solve the new question of uh, combining the roof structure and the vaulted roof uh, church interiors. Euh, juste pour évoquer encore cette, euh, ces sculptures en bois, euh, en fait, au XIIe siècle, on va voir sur beaucoup d'églises aussi des sculptures en pierre au XIIe siècle, qui sont en fait la transposition dans la pierre de ce qui existait dans les charpentes romanes. Et une interesting thing is you see also this sculpted uh, tie beam ends, and it's a trend that uh, they get petrified. So when the tie beam don't protrude outside of the masonry, they make these things in stone instead. So it's like petrified tie beam ends uh, as a decoration in the exterior. Et c'est euh, quelque chose que l'on voit aussi très bien dans l'architecture euh, antique, euh, dans les charpentes euh, des basiliques paléochrétiennes. On avait en Italie ces entrées qui débordent et qui étaient aussi sculptées. Et il y a aussi des exemples de ça dans les basiliques chrétiennes de l'antiquité antiquité avec ces sculptures de tie beam ends qui vont à de la masonnerie. Et justement, ce lien direct avec. Euh, les charpentes euh, paléochrétiennes, euh, je pense qu'on peut la faire, euh, puisque on a vraiment, comme on l'a vu aussi dans le nord de l'Europe, euh, une homogénéité des structures pour ces périodes anciennes. And uh, he thinks it's a it's a quite direct uh, line from these uh, early Christian churches, uh, because uh, it's you find it's a very big Uh, homogeneity in uh, how they built the roofs actually still in this time. Uh, dans le nord-ouest de l'Europe, on a quasiment uh, le même, uh, la même pensée technique. In Northwestern Europe, you share uh, more or less a common uh, technical thinking or way of making solutions. Avec les mêmes types de, de charpentes que l'on voit aussi bien en, en Angleterre, uh, en Allemagne, partout, et qui en fait. <coughs> qui sont assez similaires aux charpentes que l'on pouvait voir, en tout cas pour euh, le, le Haut Moyen-Âge, en tout cas euh, pour les, les basiliques paléochrétiennes, d'après les rares témoignages qu'on a, en tout cas, pour ces, ces basiliques. Et ces structures que vous trouvez dans beaucoup de pays de l'Europe, et il y a aussi des similarités avec ce qui a été construit sur les basiliques antiques. Basilicas. C'est le même patrimoine génétique. Oui, oui, c'est... <laughs> It's the same genes. <laughs> Avec, euh, et ce qui caractérise les charpentes romanes, que nous on appelle en France ch charpente à chevron formant ferme, c'est donc avoir toutes ces fermes qui sont identiques, qui sont rapprochées, avec une, euh, un report de toutes les charges sur l'entrée. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, it's what the characteristics of uh, the roof structure of the Romanesque period that you have. Uh, roof trusses all identical uh, and uh, standing quite close and uh, where you transfer all loads more or less onto the tie beam. Et que pour cette raison, les entrées sont très épais et que les, les, les bois, les raidisseurs sont très fins de 10, 10 de section. And for that reason, the tie beam is always very high and powerful and 
the rafters and especially the, the inner bracing is very uh, of a delicate section. Parce que il faut justement limiter au strict minimum les charges qui pèsent sur les entrées. Because you have to uh, uh, reduce the, the weight going to the tie beam to a minimum. Et pour ça qu'on a des pentes qui sont extrêmement faibles. Oui, and uh, that's also reason for the uh, also connected to the quite uh, low pitch of the roofs. Parce que il faut justement réduire la longueur des bois et réduire le poids de la couverture pour limiter les charges sur l'entrée. Oui, so it's a redu reduction of the length of the rafters and the timbers and also uh, minimizing the complete area of coverage, the covering of the roof. Parce qu'on ne peut pas penser euh, le report des charges pour ces périodes-là autrement qu'avec une descente verticale des charges sur le support. C'est vraiment une, une pensée technique qui est, assez, qui est très répandue partout en Europe. It's something very Common European. <coughs> On a quelques exceptions, comme ici encore l'église de l'Écode, <coughs> où au début du XIIe siècle, on a une charpente qui est complètement différente des charpentes romaines. C'est ce qu'on appelle des charpentes à portique. And uh, already, all, once again in l'Écode, you have something quite new, uh, beginning of 12th century, where you actually have built in a structure. Uh, in the shape of gates, a portique. Mm. Et ce sont donc deux pans de bois longitudinaux qui vont porter le chevronnage. Uh, that really carries the, the rafters and part of a load et, transfer. Et des, des portiques de ce type, on va les rencontrer beaucoup plus dans les régions de l'est de la France, mais plus tard au XIIIe et XIVe siècle. Uh, otherwise, this uh, type of construction you find it in eastern France, but later in the 13th and 14th centuries. Et pour uh, indiquer qu'on a trouvé encore ici au XIIe siècle ce type d'assemblage avec des, des sablières, comme on le voit partout aussi uh, mm. en Scandinavie. Et puis aussi, on a retrouvé une, un bardeau en bois mm. uh, qui, uh, qui était fixé à la couverture de, ce, de cette charpente. And uh, you find the same wall plates as we see in Sweden and Germany. And also we have found uh, part of a, the covering boards for the rafters, outside of the rafters. Donc voilà le relevé avec justement des réemplois du 11e siècle. En bleu, c'est la charpente du 12e siècle. Et en rouge, ce sont des chevrons qui ont été rapportés au 13e siècle quand ils ont changé la couverture et, euh, en tuiles. Uh, this is a, a demonstration of uh, different faces of uh, this roof in Lacotte where you have uh, uh, the blue gris uh, the roof of 1116 and uh, then the yellow ones are the reused ones from the 11th century and then in the 13th century when they changed the covering of the roof they put in these intermediary, intermediary uh, rafters uh, red. Donc cette, uh, cette structure de charpente pose beaucoup de questions puisque uh, c'est quasiment la seule de ce type. Il uh, faut savoir que nous avons aussi des voûtes maçonnées en dessous. Donc uh, peut-être que cette charpente uh, est un témoignage uh, de ce qui pouvait exister dans l'architecture civile dont on n'a aucun témoignage. Uh, it's very interesting because it's a bit enigmatic because it's the only Uh, roof of this type from this period and uh, also had a, uh, a, vo a stone vault and maybe this could be uh, an indication of what once existed in, in uh, profane uh, uh, architecture that is now lost. Ce qui est intéressant de... Les photos sont pas très bien. Euh, C'est de... C'est de voir quel type d'arbre était euh, prélevé pour euh, réaliser ces charpentes romanes. On se rend compte que euh, donc, euh, vous voyez les largeurs de cerne pour, en tout cas, tous les chevrons, les chevrons, les raidisseurs, toutes ces pièces-là, en règle générale, pour la plupart des charpentes romanes, euh, ce sont des bois 
euh, qui ont des cernes qui sont très très larges. Euh, des cernes qui ont euh, entre 2 et 3 mm d'épaisseur. Uh, it's very interesting to look at which trees were, were used actually and uh, you have a uh, visualization of uh, if you look at uh, the rafters and the racing uh, they have uh, they come from trees of a quite grand big diameter non, les plus no, petits. No, petites. Les petits, c'est pour yeah. les petits. Yeah. Les petits. They come from, uh, from trees of a quite small diameter, but they are quite dense. Or, or uh, it's large. All, it's all, ah, Des les, large. The gearings sont quite big, so they have grown quite quick. Ils sont uh, croissés rapidement. Oui. Uh, oui, oui. Voilà. Et uh, ce sont des arbres aussi très jeunes. Oui, it's uh, young, uh, quick grown timbers for the Delicate parts of the roof truss. Et paradoxalement, donc les entrées, eux, ce sont des bois qui ont des croissances très très lentes, avec notamment des âges qui sont très avancés, de l'ordre de 200 à 250 ans. And uh, in comparison, the tie beams are made of very old, straight-grown timbers that could be up to 200 years and very slow-grown. Donc ce sont vraiment deux modalités d'approvisionnement différents pour ces bois qui pourtant appartiennent à la même charpente. And you had really sort out timbers of very different quality for yes this uh, each each uh, roof construction actually. Donc pour pour ces bois-là, les bois fins, ce sont des des taillis taillis mm. copes copis Uh, so it's uh, the, the small ones, of course, it's uh, from quite young forests. Et uh, pour les entrées ici, ce sont des bois qui appartiennent à des vieilles futées, des vieilles forêts. And for the tie beams, we have had access to forests with uh, trees of different age, and you have also a large quantity of uh, really large old timbers. Avec des croissances qui sont très très lentes. Oui, and uh, with timbers that have grown very very slow and uh, very dense yearings. Au milieu du XIIe siècle, on a un changement radical euh, des charpentes. And in the middle of the 12th century, you get a very radical, uh, ch radical changes in how they construct uh, Et roofs. Il n'y a pas uh, d'évolution de la charpente romane à la charpente gothique. C'est une révolution. It's uh, really a revolution. It's not uh, that the Romanesque period roof constructions develop into Gothic solutions. It's really a, uh, a revolution. It's something completely new that appears. Et après le milieu du XIIe siècle, on ne verra plus du tout de charpente romane. And actually, the Romanesque type of construction disappears completely after this in France, at least in northern France. Et euh, donc ces charpentes, <coughs> comme on l'a vu, hein, c'est des charpentes avec des travées. And uh, now you have uh, roof constructions that are, uh, you could say, divisioned into base, a base system avec des charges qui ne sont plus dirigées sur les entrées puisqu'on les supprime. And you uh, have now a transfer of loads not onto the tie beam but onto the masonry. Mais les charges vont être transmises d'un chevron à l'autre. And you start to put loads that can go from one rafter onto the other. Et le problème de ces charpentes, c'est comme on n'a pas d'entrée à la base, les fermes vont s'écarter. And uh, the problem, of course, is that you have a, a problem that the roof wants to go outside, uh, push outside in the base, because you don't have a tie beam in each uh, truss. Donc, à cause de cette difficulté, il y a eu beaucoup de charpentes qui n'ont pas fonctionné, qui ont disparu. Donc, on a très peu de charpentes pour ces débuts de la période gothique. And for that reason, of course, many... Uh, have gone of these uh, roof constructions because they were too weak. Uh, so there are not many preserved from this uh, crucial revolutionary period. Donc là, pour réduire les charges, enfin les, les poussées latérales, on va remonter les pentes des toitures très rapidement. And uh, very soon they have realized that you have to work against this pushing out of the roof, trying to make it. 
Et on va passer en quelques décennies des pentes à 42 degrés à 62 degrés. And then you now you get very steep pitches up until 60 degrees. Et euh, comme on va passer aussi des couvertures en bois, couvertures en tuiles, on va réduire l'espacement des fermes. And with a change to uh, mainly uh, coverage of, of with tiles, uh, you also have to put the, the trusses closer to one another because of the, the load. Donc les structures sont les mêmes que celles que l'on voit un peu partout dans le nord-ouest de l'Europe, avec toujours ce système de croisée des charpes, des croisées des charpes qui vont disparaître au XIVe siècle. And you see structures that you can find in many parts of Europe, and you also have this uh, scissor bracing that actually disappears in the 14th century in, in, in France. Et donc on va avoir des différents systèmes, donc euh, notamment des systèmes parfois avec des sous-chevrons, mais ce sont des charpentes que l'on voit un peu partout. And you have different solutions, so you have also this uh, parallel rafter, a bit under the main rafter, and uh, well, you can find it in many places. <coughs> La raison pour laquelle ces charpentes gothiques sont arrivées très rapidement, c'est très certainement lié euh, au développement des voûtes maçonnées sur croisées d'ogives de l'architecture gothique. And one of the main reasons for these changes in, in roof construction uh, was the introduction of masonry vaults. Parce qu'on voit les, les, les premières voûtes gothiques sont des voûtes qui sont très bombées et qui rentrent dans les charpentes. And the early, uh, the early gothic vaultings are very high that really go up into the, the, the roof construction. Et donc, il n'était pas possible d'avoir des charpentes romanes avec ces voûtes, sauf en les mettant au-dessus des voûtes, ce qui était très problématique. And you couldn't, of course, have the, the Romanesque type with tie beams if you didn't raise the masonry, the walls, so it got on top. Et ces premières charpentes gothiques, le plus souvent, ils ont aussi des bois courbes, comme on le voit ici. And one of the early solutions for this problem is where you have tie beams, they have sought out curved wood, curved timber for this purpose. Et le gros problème aussi de ces premières charpentes gothiques, c'est que euh, en fait, les travées des charpentes sont adaptées aux travées des voûtes. And uh, you had to adapt the, the base system of the roof, of course, to the base system of the vaulting. Et qu'on a donc des travées de charpentes qui sont très très longues. And each bay gets very very long, and it's long in between the, the, the tie beams. Et qu'ici, donc, on va avoir des déformations très importantes des maçonneries. And uh, of course, in these parts of the base, you get the uh, deformations of uh, the masonry uh, going outside, pushing out. C'est pour ça qu'on a très peu de charpentes de cette période. And uh, it's the reason why very few are preserved. L'autre raison pour laquelle les charpentes gothiques sont apparues, c'est le développement des granges euh, dans la seconde moitié du XIIe siècle. And one important uh, building category for the development of uh, this gothic way of building was the 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 grange the big uh, uh, serial uh, what's called barns. the barns, barns. barns uh, uh, well connected to the church and the, the monasteries avec notamment la nécessité d'avoir une répartition des charges su avec des travées and uh, where you really needed to uh, transfer the loads with a system of uh, base. Quand l'on voit avec de, de, des piliers en pierre ou des piliers en bois. Essentiellement en bois pour le, le, la fin du XIIe et le début du XIIIe siècle. Uh, and uh, of course they were very important with us pillars making it into ales and uh, either in stone or wood. Uh, and this is something that comes with the late 12th century. Et en raison de ces contraintes de répartition des charges, il était nécessaire justement de, de supprimer les entrées dans les charpentes. And that uh, one of the reasons to well you had to abandon uh, having a lot of tie beams uh, and you instead transfer the loads uh, in the base system. Et qui est aussi une, une transfiguration de ce qui pouvait exister dans l'architecture civile dont on a très peu de traces. And uh, this is probably also a solution that was common in civil architecture, profane architecture, but where we have quite few remains. 
Ce qui apparaît très vite avec ces charpentes gothiques, c'est l'insertion dans ces charpentes de voûtes en bois. And you also very quickly get uh, this solution where you have uh, walls in, in wood in, built in in the, the roof construction as a part of it. Celle de Sainte Marie aux Anglais est la première charpente voûtée connue en France. And uh, the roof structure of Saint Marie aux Anglais in Calvados is the first known example of this in France. Elle est encore avec des des, des techniques romanes puisqu'on a encore des pentes qui sont très faibles et euh, ce qui a causé des problèmes puisque la, la voûte s'est vraiment écrasée, c'est affaissé. And but still they employed some solution, old solutions and uh, they really had also here a problem that uh, the roof was going outside in the, the raft of foot pushing et, out. Et au XIIIe siècle, ils ont rajouté euh, le poteau avec cette pièce longitudinale pour soutenir la voûte. And that's the reason why they put into the, this longitudinal beam with the pillars resting on the tie beams to keep the, the vault up, the roof up in Et the 13th century. Et c'est pour ça que donc les, les pentes avec ces voûtes qu'on a dans les églises et dans les logis seigneuriaux euh, vont aussi très vite euh, monter à 60 degrés pour éviter ce tassement. And that's why they quite quick uh, go to a steeper pitch of the roof to avoid this kind of uh, deformation, uh, not only in churches but in, in residences as well. Et euh, on va avoir donc ces, ch ces charpentes voûtées dans la plupart des logis seigneuriaux. Euh, et euh, il faut bien savoir que ces charpentes étaient apparentes, il n'y avait pas de lambris. And uh, you can see that this uh, became very popular in the residence of nobility in the 13th century and it was uh, very often so that uh, there, were no, there was no ceiling or covering boards, it was uh, a visible construction. Uh, pour soutenir les entrées, qui vont fléchir sous leur propre poids, on va voir apparaître les premiers poinçons. And uh, to, uh, <coughs> to work against the bending of the tie beam, uh, the poison or the, is the queen post or king post is introduced to keep it up. Uh. Et uh, dans, les, um, dans les grandes cathédrales, uh, le redressement des pentes va uh, nécessiter euh, du fait de la poussée des vents, euh, la par, le développement des derniers arcs boutants qui ne sont pas destinés aux voûtes, mais aux poussées des toitures sur euh, ces, ces grandes charpentes gothiques en lien avec justement les, le redressement de la pente des toits. And if you, when you have a, with these big cathedrals, a very steep pitch, and uh, of course you get lots of wind that uh, presses on the roof and as a means to uh, work against that you introduce uh, this uh, system of buttresses that actually uh, more meant to yeah. take up the that. loads of wind that. from the roof than to uh, actually work with take up the loads from a vault so it's mainly connected to the actually roof construction et le problème justement de ces de ces grandes charpentes gothiques c'est la flexion des bois And the problem, of course, with these really large roof <coughs> constructions of cathedrals is the length of uh, the timbers, and they, they flex, of course, quite a lot, like spaghetti. <laughs> Et la poussée donc générée sur les murs qui sont très minces des cathédrales gothiques. And they press on these uh, quite thin masonry tops of the cathedrals. Donc très vite, dans les années 1210-1220, on va mettre en place sur le poinçon qui va monter tout en haut des pièces longitudinales pour pouvoir euh, soulager ces charpentes. And for coping with this, already in the early 13th century, you introduce these longitudinal beams and you let the uh, king post go up to the top uh, to get a stronger construction. Comme à Notre-Dame de Paris, où on a donc plusieurs pièces longitudinales qui sont sous les fermes secondaires avec une descente des charges qui va justement être portée directement sur les murs. And uh, this we find also in Notre Dame de Paris and there you also have a you transfer the loads to a lower part of the masonry with these consoles. Et ce système de 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 de, de portique de support, on va le retrouver dans la plupart des grandes charpentes gothiques 
euh, dans les années on, entre 1210, 1220, 1230. Et cathedral roof projects from uh, 1220 1230 and on on va avoir aussi pour limiter ces poussées un rétrécissement des travées des charpentes entre les fermes principales qu'on va rapprocher and uh, they also minimize the spacing in between the, the trusses to uh, cope with uh, these loads and the transfer pour uh, comme à la cathédrale de Bayeux où on a des des travées qui font que 2 mètres 70 yeah, seulement. In, 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 in uh, Bayeux, the, the length of each bay is only 2 mètres, 2 mm. to 70. Et on va aussi utiliser des bois qui vont être courbes, comme on le voit ici. And we also, once courbes. again, use the, the curved timbers to, uh, for the, the tie beams and, the, and so on. Après, dans la seconde moitié du, du 13e siècle, euh, ces dispositifs vont disparaître et on va plutôt s'intéresser au contreventement euh, des fermes en mettant des pièces au-dessus des entrées retroussées. And uh, later on in the 12th century and uh, uh, 13th and 14th century uh, you focus much on uh, wind bracing putting wind braces. Et autre chose aussi qui apparaît en parallèle à ces charpentes gothique, c'est le développement des charpentes à ferme et panne. Another thing that develops is the combinations of uh, uh, trusses and uh, purlins. Donc avec des, 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 des pannes que l'on va voir ici et qui vont faire que les fermes secondaires vont peu à peu disparaître. And uh, that means that uh, in the end you don't really need the secondary trusses. Et qu'on va avoir très rapidement dans les années 1230 les premières charpentes à ferme et panne. And uh, around 1230, you find the fully developed uh, version of this roof of uh, uh, only primary uh, trusses and uh, purlins. Et pendant tout le reste du Moyen Âge, on va avoir les deux, donc les charpentes à ferme et panne et les charpentes à chevron formant ferme. And you will, throughout the rest of the Middle Ages, have these two versions with a Uh, roof with roof trusses and the roof with trusses and uh, purlins. Ce qui est intéressant de voir, c'est que, notamment pour toutes ces grandes charpentes gothiques, euh, on le voit, euh, plus de 90% des arbres qui sont consommés dans ces charpentes, qui sont utilisés, ce sont des arbres qui sont de très faible diamètre, c'est-à-dire qui font à peu près 20 cm de diamètre. And the 90 95% of the trees that were used for these large uh, roof constructions of the cathedrals were uh, trees of a very small diameter. Et que uh, ce sont aussi uh, des arbres qui sont très jeunes, à peu près 50 ans. And they were very young trees, uh, mostly around 50 years. Et avec encore des cernes qui sont très larges, And comme on le voit ici. Ce sont des, des cernes qui ont entre 2 et 3 mm de diamètre. And they were quite, they grew quite rapidly, so the earrings are quite wide. Et euh, comme on a affaire aussi à des techniques d'écarissage euh, à minima, c'est-à-dire qu'on suit vraiment le fil du bois. And the cutting of the hewing of the timber, you really try to keep as much of the timber as possible. You just cut away what's really, really necessary and you keep the shape of the timber, the log. Ce sont donc des bois qui vont avoir une très grande résistance à la flexion. And that gives a good quality and they keep the flexibility for tension and that was something they really wanted. Et que ces types de croissance sont certainement liés à des rejets de souche. And uh, it was uh, probably connected to a forestry very uh, yeah, determined for this purpose. Donc en fait, ce sont des, 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 des arbres, comme on le voit dans cette forêt, qui est une forêt typique du XIIIe siècle, où on a des, des arbres qui sont issus de, de souches, donc ce sont des rejets. Et 
Nice et, pictures. Et avec justement euh, des, un système racinaire qui est adulte, mmh. on va avoir des arbres qui vont devenir très longs, très fins, euh, de très faible diamètre. Et euh, à 50 ans, ils, vont, ils peuvent atteindre plus de 10 mètres, 15 mètres de hauteur. Et vous pouvez vraiment, avec ce genre de foresterie, avoir des arbres qui étaient très grands, straight grown, mais en même temps, uh, rapidement grown. Et avec une très forte densité de peuplement. And, uh, very quite, quite dense, uh, of trees. On peut avoir sur quelques hectares plusieurs milliers d'arbres pour faire des charpentes. Uh, dans, in some hectares, you could have thousands of timbers uh, really aimed for making things as uh, roof constructions. Donc, ce sont des, une sylviculture qui est caractéristique du XIIe et du XIIIe siècle et qui va disparaître au XIVe siècle. This is a typical forestry for 13th uh, century, and but it disappears later on in the Middle Ages. Et, ce, et après, les, la forme des, la, la sylviculture va, euh, va complètement changer en France pour avoir du taillis sous futé. Et plus tard, il a changé parce qu'ils ont encore voulu avoir des trees de différents âges et dimensions. Et on va avoir des arbres beaucoup plus gros qui vont transformer les structures des charpentes. Ils ont encore voulu avoir des plus grandes dimensions et ça a aussi un effet sur comment les constructeurs de roof constructors sont construits. Voilà, je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Frédéric, and great thanks to you, Robin. Um, I don't know, maybe we have questions, one or two questions, time for that. If anybody wants to ask Frédéric anything for this very interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. It was very interesting and very rich. Ah, merci beaucoup, c'était très, <rire> très plein, très riche. C'est une prestation super. Uh, I wanted to ask about the oak forests, uh, because at the pictures it looked rather like it was, I don't know how you say it in English, stub, scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the oaks, they didn't plant new oak trees, or they didn't plant themselves, but did they just grow up from the old oaks? Si. Euh, c'est peut-être ça que je n'ai pas compris moi <rire> de la France. Euh. Euh, mais c est, c est, ces forêts de chênes, euh, ils sont, euh, crois, ils sont germinés naturellement non. ou euh. ils étaient plantés Il faut que je, re, je remonte une photo. Excusez-moi. Je crois. I think. Voilà. Euh, en fait, on, il faut imaginer qu'on avait des vieilles futaies mm. avec des gros arbres au départ, au XIe siècle, qui ont été coupés et qu'on avait des peuplements qui étaient très denses et qu'on a fait des coupes rases, comme là-bas. Okay. Complete cut. Coupe. Euh, et que vraiment sur plusieurs hectares. Donc c'est vraiment des coupes rases qui ont été faites. Et c'est à partir des souches, à partir des oui, souches oui. qu'on a laissées, qu'on a eu des rejets. Oui, on a, on a kept the, the stumps. And the new trees has come from that. Et cette technique a été utilisée euh, euh, encore euh, tardivement au Moyen Âge, puisque on a des textes qui euh, mentionnent euh, la nécessité de couper euh, les souches le plus bas possible pour favoriser justement le rejet. And we this is something that was in use for a large part of the Middle Ages, and you also have written sources up where it says that you really should have the, the stumps very low to favor uh, the growth of new, mm. new trees. Et que c'est très efficace pour produire des arbres en, qui sont adaptés à l'écarissage. Uh, it's very good to have timbers uh, suitable for this kind of uh, hewing, of making, Parce que les, 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 les fûts restent longilignes et très fins euh, du, de la souche Jusqu'au sommet, on n'a pas des fûts pyramidaux, on a des fûts qui sont comme ça. 
it'll, they grow in that kind of way, uh, uh, very straight, and they don't get this pyramidal section, but they are very straight all the way. Next question, Kalle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, your research has been a great uh, inspiration for me, and um, uh, I will try to look with uh, the same things as you in uh, the Diocese of Lund, and it's totally different because in uh, medieval Denmark they used the same size, very big oaks, and not small, very old, and uh, for the tie beams uh, they used them and they split them with axe to get small parts. So it was totally different, but uh, quite at the same time. Oui, euh, Calais, il était très inspiré par ton travail et ta recherche. Euh, il a euh, essayé à faire la même chose un peu dans, dans son projet dans Skåne, dans la sud de la Suède. Mais là, il y a une image très différente parce qu'on avait les arbres vraiment grands. On pourrait... Euh, clive, euh, les fendre. Oui, oui, la fendage euh, très fin pour même pour avoir très grand euh, entrée, etc. Mmh. C'est un peu différent. On avait les forêts différents dans le même temps. Ok, I think it's time for the next lecture. Merci beaucoup, Frédéric. Hey, welcome Pano Samulainen. We will go to Finland, to the northeast. And Pano, you are a professor in architectural history, the University of Alto or Alto University. And uh, I read that you have uh, published several books uh, and also children's book. Is that about roof trusses? No? No? That's no? About, uh, it's also the really? Yes. Ah. It's a it's about history. It's to engage young people in yeah. historical. Very interesting. Please, you will uh, talk about medieval roof trusses in Finland. Yes. Welcome. Je pense. Pardon, je suis très heureux d'entendre des autres langues internationales dans les colloques internationaux que. Alors, I'm very happy to hear other languages, other international languages than English in an international colloque or conference. So thank you very much uh, uh, for this presentation. I'm very, very happy to hear it. So, but I think uh, to not uh, get Robin too tired, I will <laughs> deliver my presentation in English this time and not in French uh, and not in Finnish. <laughs> so. Uh, and in fact, I'm very happy to be here since um, this is the first time uh, this Finnish material has been presented in, uh, in any international conferences. Th so something that is quite a uh, new thing. And uh, also I have to say that I'm not here alone. Can you raise hands, all uh, the research group of the Finnish uh, persons here. So I'm going to speak uh, with the mouth of everybody, let's say so, because this is work that we are not, not doing alone. We, we have a, a group uh, uh, doing it. Okay, so first of all, uh, Finland, uh, let's say that medieval architecture in Finland is a very thin layer of heritage, uh, uh, but although quite important. So we have around uh, 70 uh, medieval stone churches in Finland are five medieval castles, and that's basically all that we have left uh, from the Middle Ages. Of course, we have uh, urban ar uh, archaeology that excavates, excavates uh, um, remains of houses and, and all that, but still standing buildings, we have less than 100, so which is uh, uh, all, all that we have. And uh, these churches, which uh, I'm going to elucidate, um, Today, they are from uh, 1270s to 1550s, uh, but mainly built during the 15th and 16th centuries. So the heritage, medieval built heritage in Finland is, uh, is very young compared to very many other examples that we have heard here and will hear in this conference. 
And uh, that what we know now, uh, original roof structures are preserved in about around 20 churches of this material, perhaps more, but we don't know yet. Uh, and these are the only preserved, preserved still standing medieval structures in the whole country uh, in Finland. And uh, of course, this has a background. Uh, we have two persons sitting there, Marko Huttunen and Lauri Saarinen, who have like uh, started this work already 16 years ago. When uh, I was a student, I, I, I participated in a course led by Marko Huttunen about the medieval roof structures in Finland. And that was like the starting point of this research. In fact, uh, now we have a big project and good funding to, to go through everything that we, we have there. And it's, uh, it's also very interesting that uh, although we have uh, some dendrochronological datings from the 80s and 90s by Markus Hiekkanen and Marta Tuknapas, uh, for example, and Pentit Zetterberg from, uh, that were done, there has been no uh, significant interest to these roof structures uh, prior, to, prior to that. And in fact, uh, the typology um, and uh, the craft research uh, of the structures it initiated only with this work of Lauri Sarina and Marko Huttunen in the, about 15 years ago in some churches. And now we are in the situation for the, the last two years where we have funding to go all through and do all the needed datings of these structures. So this is um, quite important. And uh, that, that's also the reason why all the maps that we have shown also in this conference about the dendrochronological material of Finland or the typology of Finnish roof crosses, Finland is always empty. <laughs> and it's because of this reason that we have, the publications are coming. Have this uh, group also here I'm doing, uh, it's, it's funded by Finnish Cultural Foundation and Kone Foundation. Uh, and uh, we have so uh, we have been doing this work for two years now, and the first publications uh, are published in Finnish, and then we will have publications in English quite soon about this. And the most important thing is that we have a very uh, multidisciplinary team in a way. So we have restoration architects, we have archaeologists, we have osteo an osteologist, uh, dendrochronologist, and then uh, architectural historian, which is my field, so I'm also uh, also a historian from my background. Uh, so we have we can cover quite many aspects of uh, these structures. And then a map that is quite a uh, good map. I, I think of the, uh, you might have seen this. This is uh, done by in a book by Markus Hiekkanen, uh, a very uh, important medieval archaeologist and, and architectural historian of, of, of medieval Finland. So here you see the density of medieval stone churches in, in the, in the uh, uh, Norway, uh, Norway uh, and uh, then Denmark, Sweden, Finland and Estonia. And it's very, I think this image could represent somehow the population density of nowadays. So it's, it's, there are correlations also to the, to the present time uh, well, with this map. But it shows that, uh, uh, yes, that what is the density of churches, and in fact, when we are dealing about the eastern part of, uh, of the Swedish medieval kingdom, uh, nowadays Finland, we don't have very many churches there. And uh, so the material that we are dealing with is, is the, the so-called medieval diocese of Turku, that were, or Obu, that was uh, under, under the... Uh, Archdiocese of Uppsala, where we are now. So one of the seven dioceses of, of uh, medieval Sweden. So we are, in fact, dealing with a Swedish material in that sense, and also uh, with Swedish sources. And this is the reason why we are also collaborating with uh, Matthias and Robin and, and so on. So uh, in Finland, uh, it's um, very, let's say we have a <laughs> template for the churches that we, we had in the Middle Ages. Since, uh, except of the Orland Islands between Sweden and Finland, uh, the, all the churches, they were built, uh, or almost all the churches were built in the 15th and 16th centuries. So there was a template. Very many of those look like this. So you have a, a no chancel, but a nave, then the sacristy, and, uh, and the porch, and then sometimes uh, a tower. 
So this is uh, 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 represents not any specific church, but uh, is is like a picture that could have been drawn in the uh, in the administration of the diocese in the Middle Ages, because uh, these are very uniform in a way. And uh, this is uh, yes a drawing by Laura Leinen, who is sitting there. Uh, how do these look like? Uh, some recent uh, images. This is Pyhta church from the 1460s, where we had uh, field works about a month ago. Uh, from uh, here we have like quite early dendro datings already from the 80s, and we know precisely that it's from the beginning of 1460s. Uh, and then another example that is Pernaya church. Here you see the uniformity of the churches, although these have uh, the white uh, well, white mortar on m most of these churches does not have, or they have lost uh, the mortar of the Middle Ages, so they are not white anymore. But uh, so this is uh, the material that we are dealing with. And so far, and I also uh, emphasize that this map, this map, map might change quite quite a lot in the coming years. These are all uh, the medieval structures or the preserved structure, structures that we know uh, nowadays in Finland. But it happens, uh, as, um, as many of you know, uh, at least uh, Frederick, we were uh, talking yesterday about the situation in Normandy. And uh, there is, um, uh, so that if, when you have uh, unresearched material, when you go to attics, you discover new ones quite easily. And this has been happening also this year in this project. So we discover new ones that are preserved and we have no prior knowledge about, about some medieval structures. But these are all we know for now, and they are about 20, and there might be more in the, in the near future. Uh, okay, so now I'm going uh, deeper to the roof crosses itself. So what are these? So the oldest one we know is in Lemland in uh, Orland Islands. Uh, this is a common uh, tie beam roof structure, um, maybe an addition to uh, nuts map <laughs> to, to, to be added here. And uh, these are uh, mainly from uh, 1410 to uh, 1550, so uh, the Lemland is an exception. Uh, sorry, I have th here three Tybee room flat. In fact, we have, uh, we have four of these, but not very much. And then we have a, a short phase where we have these principal raft roofs uh, where with uh, like heavier roof trusses every third roof truss in, in Pernaya, and, uh, but all trusses have the chai beam still there. But mainly these are common rafter roofs, or in fact, as we were discussing yesterday in the evening with Marco Huttonen, this cannot be called common rafter roofs. You can perhaps elucidate after this presentation that what is the difference. So uh, mainly these Gothic roof trusses that we were hearing that doesn't have any uh, chai beam, il n'y a pas d'entrée dans la structure. Um, so, uh, and uh, very interesting is also this one example of Lohja church in, in southern Finland, where we have, uh, at least to my knowledge, the largest uh, uh, roof truss, Gothic roof truss without a chai beam in Europe, which has a span of 20 meters, and it failed already in the, <laughs> in the uh, initial construction phase, so they had to support it in the in the medieval times in the uh, late 15th century already. And then also we have, of course, earlier like wooden structures, uh, earlier wooden churches, in fact, recycled to the roof structures. And this is uh, pretty interesting. Since two years ago, we discovered in a in a late 15th century structure the remains and the pieces of a 13th century, uh, 14th century wooden church uh, at Pohya Church, so that we can do even like modelings of the, how it looked like. So this gives also information about the the earlier heritage and the medieval wooden churches of Finland. So this picture might be very familiar to you, of course, the so-called Ion Stark Kallas presentation was very good that should we call this Romanesque and Gothic uh, trusses or should we use some other terms like with chai beam or without chai beam. Uh, but uh, uh, drawings by Paulina Sarnam, which I like very much these drawings because it's very simple and you can explain for everybody 
the idea very, uh, uh, let, let's say, in an easy way, that what is the principle of the uh, loads and the forces in the uh, structure with a chai beam, everything goes down. And when you have this Gothic truss, uh, as we heard very well in Frederick's uh, presentation, uh, that uh, the force, it, it makes the problem that uh, like uh, the forces are leaning also outside of the structure. So, uh, and mainly we have these Gothic trusses in Finland. And uh, so the general typology, there is one example of uh, Sipo church, which is quite, quite um, uh, exceptional and, and uh, individual in the Finnish material, which is like this, and it represents the transition from the Chinese trusses to, to the Gothic trusses, and mainly we have this. So also the trusses as the churches are very uniform, what we, we encounter in the Finnish material. And uh, the wood species, uh, all the structures, if I remember correctly, you can mark up perhaps say something else, but it's only pine and spruce. We, we encounter no oak, no, no other wood species in these. But the dowels, uh, we have uh, other species. We have even like, like apple trees or, or birch or, or arden or so on. So that's, there is bigger variety in this. And uh, also an interesting feature in these structures is that, is that we have, of, of course, this kind of uh, um, assembling uh, numbers uh, and uh, numberings and carvings, but they do not exist after 1480. So these have been done without any kind of <laughs> any kind of carpenter's marks, which is uh, relatively in interesting also in the structures. And we can uh, count in some of these uh, structures that they were assembled in uh, in piles uh, of six to to eight trusses on the ground, and then mounted up uh, to the structures. And uh, Mainly the technique, uh, the carving technique is continental, continental technique uh, and uh, this spread hooking that we saw in, um, and I think we will hear more in Robin's uh, presentation about spread hooking. Uh, but this exists only in one uh, structure that is the recycled church of Pohja. Uh, uh, we, so the logs and the roof trusses were used in the new structures of the stone church. So that's uh, mainly. So the sim overall picture of the Finnish material is very, very simple. And all, I also want to emphasize that in this project, we are uh, paying quite much attention to the public uh, and the general pu public beyond academia. And we already, in fact, had an exhibition at the Finnish Museum of Architecture. Uh, this, I, I hope very much if there is someone who would like to have this exhibition in, in Sweden, that would be very good since we have all the text also in Swedish. In, in Finland we have to have Finnish, Swedish and English texts. So uh, this is quite nice, a small exhibition that could be taken somewhere here. And we had also a scale model of, of Karia church, uh, roof trusses and the construction that how these were made uh, to be exhibited to the, to the public. Uh, so this gives a good impression to you that how this functions. So Gothic trusses without any time beeps in the whole, whole structure. And uh, this has also caused quite many problems as we heard that there in France uh, uh, we, we are lacking the structures of this age because they were not functioning. And also in Finland we have had problems with this, these structures quite a lot. Just to show, uh, it's very rare that from one country you can show a simple Excel from everything we know. But <laughs> in fact, we have the situation here. So, so if you look at this, uh, we have um, collected here the different datings that we know uh, for now. And we ha still have some preliminary <laughs> dendro datings that we don't yet have the report. Uh, and we have to take some new samples to be sure. So, um, but this is general picture now that from the most structures we know that they are from the Middle Ages, we know the dating, but uh, the work is ongoing. So that's the reason why, why this table is not yet finalized. Okay, and you see also the, the, uh, the, chai, uh, the chai beams and the, the without chai beams, so Gothic structures here and in some churches you have both structures existing, which is pretty interesting since 
here you see the transition uh, from uh, tie beam structures to the Gothic trust that happens uh, in Finland in the 1450s. Yes, and some examples. Uh, this is pretty interesting. It's a case of Pernaya Church, where you have a principal tie beam roof uh, with a wooden ceiling from uh, 1440. Uh, and for some reason, in, um, after 15 or 13 years, uh, they make the, made the decision to build uh, brick vaulting in the church. And this caused, of course, problem because they had to cut the tie beams off and uh, build like a new structure, tie beam like structure uh, to this one. And this tells, because at the same time in other churches, we have the uh, uh, apparition of, of, of Gothic truss everywhere else in Finland. So this also makes the gives us a very good transition, information of the transition from the time beam trusses to the Gothic trusses. And this, this is also pretty interesting in the scale of whole Sweden, since we see the same transition in, in 1450s, for example, in the Guild of, of Carpenters of Stockholm, that is coming out like more, more and more continental masters uh, in, in Sweden. And then about uh, the marks and carvings, we have, uh, although let's say uh, that the Finnish churches are quite uh, muet, silent. yes, silent. Uh, yes, sorry, <laughs> it's like when you speak one language uh, the whole evening, then you are. It, 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 it's like overruns your your thinking, but uh, but we have some. Uh, we have pretty interesting markings here. Uh, so. Uh, First of all, this is an example of a game board from Hauha Church from the beginning of 16th century. And this uh, game board has been carved to the structures, I think, in the, uh, in the construction site when the, the carpenters had some free time or something else. And then we have house marks, we have these numberings and, uh, or carpenters' um, marks, assembly marks, even builders' marks, perhaps trademarks, we don't know magical symbols, graffitis and images, and, post, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and here we have uh, some uh, examples of, uh, of a house mark. So according to, to the Swedish uh, church law, uh, it was uh, required that every peasant or every house owner of the, of, the, uh, of the parish provide some building material for the church construction. And this is why we encounter uh, uh, especially in the church of Kemimba in the very north of Finland, this kind of house marks in the structure. So they, the explanation by, in an article by me and uh, Laura Line and Marko Huttun and others is that they just marked all the piles of the wood with their house mark to, to uh, make sure that, okay, this is my tax paying portion. I have done it. So it was uh, that way. And these are very haphazardly position in the in the structures mainly. And then you have some, uh, yes, let's say images even carved uh, to the structures, but these are quite rare. Uh, perhaps builders marks uh, and then some quite fine uh, house marks. Uh, these photos are from Kemima Church from Finland and it's very interesting that these are carved uh, very carefully uh, and uh, and the marks, they are just above the altar in the last truss. So there might be also some magical or, or intentional meaning to put uh, uh, those pieces of wood there. And we made also some uh, mail and thing of text uh, between things and texts, uh, uh, historical archaeology about these Kevima carvings, which we know from the structures, and then we compared those to uh, to um, post-medieval or early modern documentary material that we have and could uh, like identify same same house marks in the in the documents, which was um, which was uh, yes an interesting journey or trip to investigate. And then what we get of this uh, out of these churches, this is also quite interesting. Uh, at at Pohja Church. For instance, we had uh, we were able oh yes we were able to identify this kind of uh, disaster which which happened, uh, and this 
took some days to understand that what has happened. But this is a very original plan, vaulting plan of one bigger vault on the southern side and there's smaller vault uh, on the northern side uh, of the nave, so inspired by the Franciscan churches. And it is evident that it was somehow communicated to the roof cross masters that you have to take this into account so that the ashlar post uh, is positioned differently on the side where they have the bigger, bigger vault. But for some reason, these were assembled like 180 degrees in the wrong right direction, these trusses. Perhaps the roof truss constructors imagined that the bigger vault would be on the other side. And this is the reason why uh, the vault constructors, they have to cut down all the ashlar posts of the structure. So you can also uh, discern and understand quite a lot of the whole construction of these churches and, and also the building process via, via um, the research of the roof structures uh, here. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, interesting recycled material, one tie beam of uh, for this century. Wooden church recycled into a newer structure. So uh, this is the. Um, um, so it has been a chai beam, but nowadays it's a anchor post in the in in the newer structure. And these are the dendrodatings of these are underway now, but it's very interesting since from these pieces that we find in the church we can uh, we can reconstruct that how the wooden church of uh, 14th century in fact looked like. Then again, we have, uh, of course, individual um, PhD projects, and one of these is not uh, concentrating to the wooden structures, but to the brickmaker's marks. So if there is anyone who is interested in these and have this material and the churches, please go to talk to Ilari Alto, who is making the PhD thesis of these uh, marks in Finland. Okay, so that was the, like, the serious part of the presentation, then we have some, just some pictures about the, uh, about the group uh, in, <laughs> in, a, in a church and uh, about the everyday life of, uh, of the research. And then I know that I don't have very much time left, but I will tell you that what is next. So we are going to finish the field works and the surveys and uh, write, of course, articles and then go to conferences uh, as we have been already doing. Then we have uh, three PhD theses uh, coming out, uh, four PhD theses coming out of this project uh, and also a final report that will be written in Finnish and English for the use of other, other researchers so that we get Finland <laughs> on these maps. And uh, then we have also a documentary film that is coming out of this project, so that's why we have a film director here as well. So this is also the idea of the project that we get uh, some, let's say, the general public to know that what is the worth of these structures, and that's why we are we are very active in in uh, social media and also with this kind of interventions that how to communicate science to to the big public. And uh, uh, an advertisement about the conferences, as you were mentioning, we are organizing in, in Helsinki a conference from forests to heritage, which combines dendrochronology and, and ecolo forest ecology research and heritage researchers in May 2024. So there is no yet information about this uh, 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 online, but it will be very soon. So this will be an e event of course, to meet and uh, please uh, follow different channels of, of mails and social media to participate in that. Okay, so uh, I thank you very much and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. <laughs> thank you very much, Pano. This is, uh, we are looking forward to the publications and really impressive work impressive also integrating the dissemination and engagement in the research project uh, we have uh, soon coffee we have coffee waiting but we have time for one question Ulrich no there yes mm. Uh, 
did uh, the uh, building activity continue after 1550 in Finland? Yes, of course. Of course it continued, but no, not with the uh, stone churches mainly. So from the, the period between uh, 1550 and uh, the end of 18th century, we have only like, was it four or five stone churches of, in, in Finland. So the building activity of the stone church is a measuring architecture of, of uh, sacral or, or church architecture. It ceased completely. We have, of course, wooden churches. So we are going to back, back to that tradition. So uh, nowadays uh, we have uh, about uh, 16 uh, wooden churches left from the 17th century and much more about the more recent times. But uh, w w what ended was stone construction of churches. So that's also pretty interesting. So the last, uh, last stone, stone church, it was accomplished in 1550, and then nothing. <laughs> okay, thank coffee. you. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Now we have 25 minutes coffee break. Yes. Yes.